Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. Well, Jacob, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate it. Um, do you mind giving us a brief bio and some of the big ideas you're interested in? Sure. Um, I'm a Russian-Israeli, so I was born in the Fadian Soviet Union, grew up in Israel, um, studied math and physics, just kind of almost by default by inertia. I served in the Israeli army, worked on some cool secret projects. But then once that was done, I kind of like wasn't really sure what to do with my career. And so I came to the U.S. for business school, um, which both made it possible for me to come to the U.S. and get a job, but also... In business school, I realized I'm like the only math nerd there. And we were learning things like, you know, the correct answer doesn't matter. You just got to be confident and sell yourself. <laughs> um, and I was like, man, this is kind of weird. Is this like everything in the US? But this set me up to discover the rationality community and less wrong, which happened about like almost 10 years ago. Basically, since then, I've been um, really one of the last people who like proudly wears the brand of being a rationalist. Even if everybody else has like given up, it's like oh, I'm a meta, right. Right? I'm a post. Right, right. Uh, everyone has to be a hipster. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, now I live in New York. Um, I have a three and a half week old daughter. Um, maybe she will add some ambience to this podcast recording Absolutely. from the other room. Definitely, we're big uh, yeah. pernatalist here, so that it would be. It'd be yeah, perfect. I saw some questions about that. Um, Definitely. Now, yes, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so. I think like the dichotomy of foxes and hedgehogs, of whether you know many things shallowly or one thing deeply. I'm an extreme fox, which means that I will never write a book in my life, but I'm very good on Twitter. Um, and so I know you probably like have me here because you read my blog, which is somewhere in the middle. Um, but they do kind of just become obsessed with something different every two weeks and then try to write about it uh, before I have it figured out. And then once I have, I move on. Uh, so I'm like very happy I'm not in academia because this is like really bad for academia. It's really good if you're just a generalist. Um, a couple of things that you know I've been obsessed with for more than two years. I think oh this might be like a real, a real love is rationality and how to expand it. I think a lot of people treat it, you know, the sequences in the early writings as this finished product or just something that assembled the community. I'm like, no, no, this is the has to be step one. There's like clearly so much more to do here and to figure out about the brain and consciousness. Uh, so I've been thinking about that a lot, especially once we discovered what predictive processing is and how to think of the brain as a Bayesian machine that learns everything from scratch and hallucinates the world. Um, and probably the other thing I've been consistently writing and thinking about is dating. Uh, in part because I think it's like a fascinating uh, kind of topic to look at generally, systematically, and also because I date a lot and it's really fun and important to me. So I may as well put some thought into the matter. Definitely. I I, I love that. I, I want to jump off the uh, the outline, if that's okay, and, and ask you some questions about predictive processing and uh, and Carl Friston. You know, I, how how much do you buy, you know, Friston's theory around predictive processing? Do you think it, it is uh, explanatory? And, and do you have any big critiques of the theory? I'm not sure. So... I'm like not as familiar with the um, particular history of who came up with what. So Freestyle is somewhat sem- uh, famous for basically coming up with the idea that predictive processing in the brain, basically you can think of the brain as just, you know, you have this collection of neurons and you can explain everything the brain does by just trying to predict its own state, which means because it's connected to the outside world, you know, like some of your neurons are happen to be hooked up to your retina and they react to light it means, you know, you have to like start predicting your own inputs and to predict your own inputs, you need basically to either become or to have a model of the outside world. Uh, now, Friston says, oh, this is just part of a more general principle called free energy minimization. I think I have a kind of tenuous grasp of what it means. It roughly means something like 
uh, if you want to persist to something recognizable, right? Like, you know, maybe you're just like a single cell organism floating somewhere. For you to persist as yourself, as like this closed thing that's not being just like torn apart by entropy, um, to do that, you kind of have to basically take advantage of your environment, right? Like kind of find yourself in places where there's like more food and less toxins and stuff like that, uh, which means that your internal structure has to, in some way, model the outside world. Uh, right? In some sense, you know, if you just have like a simple flipper that you can like swim this way or that way, well, you can look at it and say, oh, this is a model of the world because the flipper is always going to point, you know, towards food and away from like poison. Um, and so basically by virtue of you persisting generally, uh, you have to minimize free energy. And, you know, what does it mean in the case of the brain? It means minimizing how much you're surprised. Uh, and I think a lot of like really smart neuroscientists looked at this and because kind of like a more general thing, theory like a different level of abstraction i'm not sure it has a lot to tell about like the brain specifically um which is maybe why a lot of neuroscientists were confused um so i don't know right there's like a lot of things if you're like a car mechanic you're working on a great you know car engine and then you didn't know about some like low thermodynamics that applies to like literally any transfer of energy anywhere now somebody tells you like okay cool I'm sure that my engine is not going to violate the second law of thermodynamics, but also it doesn't actually help me here. Um, right. So, so maybe it's something like it's a, it's a good theory, but like practically may, few practical applications. And that's why neuroscientists kind of uh, gloss over it a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. I've had like people over who try actually try to figure out just brought like a bunch of people and got us some beers or coffee for whoever wanted it and spend some time on it. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia article for the free energy principle, um, kind of has a closed mathematical form, but again, like I'm not sure that's very useful, right? Just because as a physicist, so you can, you know, we're just going like, to describe this thing with this Greek letter and then put inside an integral. And right. so, you know, your persistence over time is like, you know, minimizing the integral of your surprise over your expected lifetime or something like, okay, that's, um, and if I'm thinking like I'm trying to write an essay right now about how uh, babies learn concepts. Right, because like my newborn doesn't really think she doesn't know like words. I don't think she like knows the external world exists. She patches herself in the nose because she doesn't know her arm belongs to her. How do you get from that to somebody who can read the blog post about some term? Like, I don't know, cultural toxoplasma. You're like, oh, this explains things. And I'll see the world differently. Um, so like I'm not sure pretty process or uh, free energy principle is super applicable here. Um but again, I don't want to talk too much shit about Carl Friston because can I haven't really tried to uh, get deep. I've been at a couple of parties where a couple of people got really drunk and started like really going on kind of like batshit stories, throwing like conspiracy theories and how everything is connected. And almost everybody who goes on a rant like that uh, tosses in Carl Friston oh, at nice. like eight <laughs> minutes in. And so that's like not a really strong a black flag, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. That's great. That's great. Um, Jacob, I, I want to ask you this. This is also not an outline, so I apologize, but it just popped in my head. You know, uh, you went to Keenan Flagler Business School. Is that correct? Yeah. Got an MBA? Cool. So I, I went to Keenan Flagler as well. Um, and if I imagined business school, well, as an undergrad, but if I imagined business school and I had to typify it, it's something like the anti-rationalist community to some extent. You know, super people are super ex, like incredibly extroverted, like the most extroverted people, um, and it, it just seems like, in, in some sense, uh, the inverse of it. In some ways, it, do you do you uh, agree with that characterization? Um, and, and if so, like why do you think that is? Well, like as I mentioned, it kind of was for me, but also, like I don't think it's like the exact polar opposite, right? It's not. Uh, like chakra school right um and in some sense you know like rationalists are supposed to win right you're supposed to kind of like operate in right. the real world um and all of the limits of various models and so in business school you learn a lot of models of like oh right you know like how does a company finance itself or we have this formula called cup m between debt and equity right no one actually cares about that right you look, look at actual companies what they do it's kind of driven by whatever kind of local considerations um right. seem to be happening uh and so like you can extract a lot of rationality from it 
right? It's not like the general mathematical rules. You kind of learn them in finance class. You forget about them. No one cares. Um, the important thing to learn is like, okay, what are people's goals? What are people trying to do? Um, and then, you know, to be agreeable and like slightly ambitious, but not too much. And, <laughs> and I'd just be willing to think about money a lot. Right, right. Uh, those are kind of requirements. <laughs> Like out of all the different business schools, I do recommend Kinan Flagler to people because it's one of the least academically rigorous business schools out of the top 20 for MBA. Like I actually really wanted to get into the business school in Virginia. And in the end, it was actually, it was me and another Israeli guy and we were both on the wait list and we kind of got to know each other. And then Kinan Flagler accepted me and told me they were even to give me a scholarship. So I actually emailed Virginia and said like, hey, I'm taking myself off the wait list because I need to give Caroline an answer and I'm going there. Also, you should accept this other guy. He's great. Trust me. I was like, whatever. <laughs> I don't know if they would care. The next day they accepted him and he had a oh, terrible wow. experience because he stayed yeah. up until 2 a.m. every night doing homework. And it doesn't make sense because even the academically rigorous business schools aren't rigorous academically. You don't actually <laughs> learn like descriptive knowledge that is important. It's a kind of flagger, which is a lot more friendly and a lot more about kind of building relationships and having some fun and living in a great college town. Um, like there's a crew of knowledge there <laughs> and uh, you kind of like pick up personality, you know, between the cracks if you ignore what the professors say. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you know, it quintupled my salary from like what I was making in Israel before business school and the first job I got in the US after. So like I wouldn't college. quite call it anti-rationality. <laughs> Right, right, not quite. Like hitting yourself with a rock on the head is anti rational Right, right, that's fair. <laughs> but it's it may be 170 degrees. It's not like all. It's not all the way around, but it's close. Yeah, it's rationality agnostic. Gotcha. That makes sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm gonna take another left hand turn here. Uh, can you steel man polyamory? Sure. You want to start by steel man in monogamy? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, like a... <laughs> Do you want me to try or you? Well, it was like a bit tongue in cheek. Um, I think probably kind of my best element of polyamory is um, it's kind of an idea I got from Esther Perel's book, which isn't really about polyamory, but to me, it seemed to kind of very strongly made the case for it, which is it's kind of this mainstream model of monogamy where um, your partner is kind of supposed to like fulfill a lot of needs for you. Um, where like the expectations people have of their partners are, like much higher than they used to, right? If gotcha. you're someone like 19th century, you were like most of people are farmers. You're like, hey, can you work on this farm and can you have like four healthy kids? Right. That's and now it's part. like, oh, you need to be my confidant and you need to be like my exclusive sexual partner and you also need to be like my best friend and also to help me like manage the family household and stuff. Um, and people are a lot of people, you know, they kind of live away from their families because they like went to school and then like went to some city for a job. They don't have like that much support network and kind of your partner has to do all that stuff. And also everyone's identity is very strongly tied to it. Right? Before you were like, well, I'm a carpenter. And then, yeah, also like I have a wife. Whereas now like the idea that you're not a perfect husband or not a perfect wife is like so scary. It's basically like completely destroys your identity and your self image. And is like reason to panic and try some desperate therapy and stuff like that. Um, and so like, clearly something's not working. Um, people like aren't marrying and like, if they are, they're like divorcing more and they're just gonna see them unhappy. Um, and there's some like inherent contradictions that are just very hard to resolve, right? Like if you need your spouse to provide a lot of security and dependability, that's just not sexy. Um, right. like it's very hard for that person to also be the subject of your, hottest sexual fantasies because you don't <laughs> fantasize about dependability right um and so it seems okay you need to like break out of this mainstream model and come up with something new that actually works for you and if you start rethinking things from scratch uh i think a lot of people would arrive at the point where they're like oh actually you know maybe like i felt some jealousy and i realized that my jealousy you know isn't like actually telling me about how the world is it's maybe a vestige of some evolved psychology which doesn't matter anymore because it's not like my wife's going to get pregnant with another man's kids and they won't know about it right we have like birth control and genetic testing <laughs> um you know maybe i get like 
maybe she'll leave me if she meets someone else. And maybe I have evidence that she don't. Um, and so if you kind of, you don't assume that your jealousy is always truthful and you kind of don't assume that you just need to go with the mainstream model since it seems to be failing, uh, you might end up in all kinds of arrangements. Um, so I don't know. I'm not married. My wife is the most important partner to me. We're really committed to each other for the long term, but we also date other people. And there's gotcha. people that way more on the side of relationship anarchy that like refuse to, you know, make any commitments to anyone or even put labels. And then there's like monogamish people who are like, look, oh, you know, if you were like traveling for a war conference and you made out with someone, like it's fine. But, you know, like make sure I don't find out about it. Um, right. So there's there's a lot of lot, there's a the wide spectrum here, um, but it does sound like um, you know you are married, and, and so you, do you think a marriage like as a repeated game is valuable in itself? I do. I mean, it seems like there's some things that you kind of can only achieve if there is someone who you kind of see as your equal, both in terms of their ability and in terms of how much you care about them, and like satisfying their preferences and making they're happy who's, you know, it doesn't have to be like till death goes apart, but there's like no clear end line. Makes like sense. you can kind of, whatever like, you know, length of future you can plan for yourself, you can plan with two people. And so it's not just, you know, like to have a child, you kind of need two people as a biological constraint. Um, right. Aside from like, you know, sperm donors and stuff like that. But just in general, you can plan a career for two people. Um, you know, the stuff that I've been writing a lot about is, like it's very useful to have somebody who's smart and insightful just kind of looking at you and trying to figure out, you know, what your problem is, what do you actually want? So the sort of things you're trying to figure out about yourself, like you have like one extra person who's like really smart and really like pays attention to you, who can help you with that. It is great. But for them to like actually be honest and help you, I think it is important to be committed to each other long term. And I like think specifically what a wedding does is you're like, hey, it's a signal to outsiders and a bit to yourself. Be like, please put social pressure on us to like act as if we are committed to each other indefinitely. And like give us shit if we're like you <laughs> we're know, bad to each other. To be yeah. Breaking this promise. And it's like very useful, right? We all live in societies. Um, right? Like, yeah. That makes a, it, it, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it's a very uh, uh the, the model um yeah, it explains a lot about about why we do these things. You know, it's like, uh, you know, we have our communities. They encourage us to continue this repeated game, and because we do it in public, there's there's much more pressure to to maintain these relationships in a in a robust manner. Um, I mean, ideally, in a marriage, that repeated game is when you think, okay, look, I have my interests, and there's this other person, but because we're going to be playing this indefinitely, I should cooperate instead of defection. Um, I think in a romantic relationship, you can actually, you know, get beyond that point and get to a point where you kind of think of the two of you as one agent. Nice. But like, you don't have to like ask the other person what they want. You're like, okay, I'm just going to make the decision that's kind of best for the sum total of both of us. And maybe I get it wrong. And then you tell me, and then I'll improve my model of you. But you're actually not trying to see like, okay, where can I still win? It's not going to piss off the partner too much. Right. But- where can I actually do what's good for both of us? Um, it's a very relaxing and nice. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. No, that's that's good. That's good. Um, I, I want to take another left hand turn here and talk about political polarization in the West. Um, do you see a way out of you know this current crazy tribal environment we have? Do you think, or do you think things just kind of generally get worse and worse and worse, or is there kind of a way back? And what does that way back look like if it exists? So. I think if you look at the historical context, we're like really not that polarized. We're like, ah, race relationships are as bad as they've ever been. Like, bro, have you seen 1850? Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, that was bad. Or also like in the global context. Um, I think, you know, the like American millennials think, oh, this looks so bad now. And then you tell them what's going on in other countries. But they're like those other countries' relationships with their neighbors. And they're like every part of the world, you know, from East Asia, South Asia, anywhere in Africa, anywhere in Latin America. Um, so I'm not sure polarization is actually increasing. Um, I think there is a sense in which there kind of was this stable equilibrium for a while, like two big narratives, right? Like the blue gotcha. tribe and the red tribe. And they are kind of like controlled everything, right? Like all the newspapers were either red or blue, all the TV channels were either red or blue, and everybody only had like the newspapers and TV. 
And so everybody just like pick the team and you're like, well, the other side is so wrong. So my side must be right. Um, and there was kind of an alignment. Um, I think people wrote about it, that if you kind of look at a, like whether the parties agree or disagree on different issues. So like maybe in the sixties, you know, a lot of voters had opinions that aligned with like one party or another. There's kind of like a mix of both. And now pretty much everybody has all Democrat or, or all Republican opinions, but I don't think it's because the underlying opinions change, but just the parties that like, figured out how to do data science and aligned around those things. Um, so I actually don't think we're becoming much more polarized because I think the kind of those two big narratives are kind of collapsing. Gotcha. The people don't actually watch red or blue tribe stuff. I don't know. They, they listen to like Joe Rogan gets more listeners than cable news. Uh, what does he believe in? I don't know. Bigfoot. He's not. <laughs> right. like, he's, he's kind of polarizing because he touches on like hot topics that are polarizing, like right. you know, COVID vaccines. That's yeah. a the hot topic of the day. Yeah. But he's not like a culture warrior. He the, the aliens guy. Or, you know, he's like a very good interviewer who's kind of intellectually humble and has cool guests. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm gonna see people splintering into more and more subcultures or just kind of not caring about global narratives uh and then like the partisans of the two narratives will keep like you know yelling at each other on twitter um you can kind of just avoid them right is, you just kind of have to keep keep track of like what are like the five words i'm not allowed to like mention this week right <laughs> uh, this week i can't talk about the nets i can't talk about truckers and i can't talk about whatever booster right. okay great <laughs> Is it is it something where like uh it, it just feels very visceral because the fights on Twitter are so nasty, but in reality, you know, things are just pretty pretty calm. Is that what you think? Yeah, well part of what Twitter does is like like before you wouldn't really know what the other side thinks. Right. Uh you kind of live in your own bubble. It's not necessarily geographical, right? But uh like most people who aren't Trump voters kind of know zero Trump voters. Right. But right? you live in some, you know, like you live in Brooklyn. Is maybe like 80% Democrat, but also if you're like an educated class person who works in a white collar job, now it's more like 95. Right. And the 5% Trump voters are not going to tell you. Right. Um, but you're only going to find out about them because they're on Twitter. Right. Uh, whereas before, you know, they'd be having their own like parties somewhere and yeah. you just wouldn't know the horrible stuff that they're saying. Right. Um, but now everybody gets to see it on Twitter. Yeah. Like it's average out. That makes sense. Um, do you think it's possible to encourage people to have more kids? Send my take on this. I wrote, it's actually the most controversial post I ever wrote, at least in terms oh, really? of like just direct hate I've been getting. Oh, God. It's a post called anti antinatalism where I looked at um, the antinatalist philosopher, David Benatar. Yeah. Uh, I kind of critiqued some of his philosophical arguments. They just seem to be not very rigorous or particularly convincing. It's, even if you look at his completely decoupled, philosophy thought experiment like it seems to require sort of like negative utilitarianism that few people will actually endorse as being intuitive and then there's the economic argument of you know the more people there are the fewer stuff there is for every person like less land less water you know less t-shirts and i think that's like actually wrong in terms of how the economy yeah. works uh and you know how many people you need for specialization right and you know, like this was shared in the antinatalism uh subreddit where people called me horrible names um <laughs> But then once I started looking at it, it seemed that it has a, nobody was really persuaded by that philosopher, but also nobody has really been persuaded by my blog post. Um, and it seems that almost everybody I know, you ask people like, hey, like, do you like your parents? Did you have a happy childhood? Are you happy now? And I give the answer kind of yes to all of those. Those people are pro-natalist. And if the answers are no, they're anti. Um, Interesting. And so it does seem to me that people's... Um, kind of opinions about kids are somewhat downstream of those. So a lot of people are talking, this is like a conversation I got into this week. Um, like a lot of young people are saying, well, I don't want to have kids because of climate change. Right. Like the planet is going to shit, the seas are going to rise, the crops are going to dry out. Like how can I bring kids into this world that's getting worse? And also me having more kids will make, you know, they will consume resources and burn fossil fuels and stuff like that. Um, I think when people see this sort of stuff, they really strongly assume that this thing is kind of upstream. Like people read about climate change and now they want to have fewer kids. And I don't have a good data on it, but at least, I don't know, I would, 
at least relative to where common opinion is, I would assume it's much more the other way. So people just feel, you know, kind of unmoored. They're like generally anxious, either because of the general situation or, you know, just like their own lives. They're like, you know, far from their support systems. You know, their kind of career is unpredictable. They can't find the date. And they're like, well, I can't say that, you know, like my life is too messed up. So I don't want to have kids because it seems like kind of scary and I'll get to play fewer video games. It's like, okay, is there some narrative I can reach for? Oh, yeah. You know, it's about uh, climate change. And that, I don't know, if I can make like, people happier and kind of their lives more stable and like, surround everybody with the like, good friends and tell parents to like be nicer to their kids and, you know, give them a longer leash. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to give them less shit, then people might be happier to have kids. Gotcha. So it's less like um, uh, like whatever they do in Hungary with, you know, we'll get you a car if you have six kids or something. It's more just like better social environments for people, be nicer to people. And Maybe. I mean, I'd be very curious to see, right, like, well, Hungary is trying things, most like economic incentives. And they yeah. do think, I mean, economy probably matters to some extent in the margins. Um, China is trying different things. They're like, okay, you know, Guys are not allowed to play video games or like watch CC men on video sites. So they'll like need to be like much. I don't know. I guess if you gave like all men testosterone injections and all women, like people will be like more gendered than more horny. Um, <laughs> so I'd be like curious to see if that stuff works. Um, I could also imagine, I don't know, if, if in Hungary, like, like if the country is just like doing well and people feel proud to be Hungarian and like they're all in this together. And kind of like the rest of Europe hates them, but they believe in like the future of the Hungarian people and like the strong leader is in charge. But this sort of just a like sense of, you know, confidence and togetherness. I would kind of my sense is that that would have as big an impact on birth rates as giving people a tax break. That makes sense. But I don't know. I mean, maybe like my bias is, is that I'm Israeli, which is a country that's kind of very optimistic and has a lot of solidarity. Uh, and it's in part because we're kind of surrounded by enemies while also being like richer and more successful than all of them. So it's kind of like the perfect place. And Israel is like the only OECD country, I think currently, where the, the fertility rate is way above replacement. And it's not just religious people. It's like, you know, I have two Regular siblings. People. And like all my secular friends whose, you know, both parents are working, have siblings. And it seems to have more to do with that. At the like birth rate, you know, the best predictor of it is like how many people are on SSRIs and not what the tax oh, policy really? is. Super um, fascinating. It, it makes it even a, a tougher challenge there, right? Like if you're you know, a policymaker in the West, like what do you do then, right? I mean, it's just, just very difficult. Yeah, I think, I don't know how much it has to do with policy, it's maybe more with culture. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, if the US, everybody feels like, oh, with like a decadent empire in decline right. <laughs> then just as long like, as like, that's this that's kind of the prevailing atmosphere uh people have fewer kids it's difficult um, that's cool. but i think i don't know those things are like quite open questions i'm not really confident i think it might be very different for different people right <laughs> like i look my own life story where i'm israeli but i'm also secular and also polyamorous but also like you know from the moment that like, i hit my mid-20s and started thinking about kids i was never like worried about who I have money to pay for food this month. So I can totally imagine for other people, it's actually driven by completely different considerations. Uh, I'm trying to encourage all of my friends to have kids. My friends who are mostly successful and have good jobs and, you know, have like great genes. <laughs> they should like think that, you know, their kids are going to turn out healthy and smart and happy. Um, they seem reluctant to have kids. And then I'm trying to tell them it's just like how cool it is to be a dad. <laughs> And and you do think you've gotten a utility out of being a parent? So far, yeah. Well, I mean, I think most of the utility is backloaded. Gotcha. Um, I think Brian Kaplan made the good point that, you know, when you're 25, you think like, man, I can maybe like be able to take care of half a baby. Right. And then when you're 40, you think I can probably, you know, like raise two kids. Then when you're 70, you think, man, I wish I had five kids. You know, at least somebody would come to visit every week. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, the trouble is you have to make the call when you're 25 or 30. Right. So, you know, insofar as you care about your own future, you got to sort of average out throughout your life. You know, maybe like you should have three kids 
and it's gonna make your early 30s a bit worse and your 60s much better that makes sense um i mean so far it's pretty cool i mean i'm like a month into parenthood and you know, i can really recommend it <laughs> uh, and maybe my wife is really enjoying it how much you know she kind of it's almost like a drug she became obsessed with the baby uh and just really like enjoys just staring at her face it's a pretty cool experience i love it that's cool that's cool um my next question is what's the best way to spend money to increase your happiness yeah so i wrote a post about it which you know kind of looking at some analysis um i said oh you know there's a lot of like uh you know products that you don't consume conspicuously uh Right, kind of like if you buy a car, well, everybody can see which car you have or which watch you wear. And it's like a Rolex doesn't really do that much for you. Um, and also when somebody sees like a man in a Lamborghini, they think, oh, that's a cool car. They actually don't think that's a cool man. Right. <laughs> By and large. Um, now, in terms of like your happiness in general, like, yeah, I think it's like a good idea, you know, to like buy the best barbecue sauce and the like, most expensive soap. Uh, because they actually, you know, like provide great value if you spend fifteen dollars and not five. Um, I don't know if, like, overall, you know, having like much better soap is a huge impact on your happiness. Um, I was in an Uber ride uh, with this guy, and I kinda, you know, asked him, you know, like when he started this shift, and he's like, "Oh, I'm like an hour ten. Oh, like, shit, like hour ten? You've been like working all night. This was like five a.m. He's like ten hours in, and I got to talking with him. He kind of mentioned basically like." he and his friends just kind of seem to spend all their money on like fashion sneakers mostly. Oh, nice. And then if like somebody doesn't buy the latest expensive fashion sneakers, kind of people make fun of him. And so they all kind of end up working way too much because they're in this weird arms race. <laughs> that's mostly around like uh rap fashion and fashion sneakers right. and stuff like that. So I think look, like the biggest thing about like money and happiness is like, don't make like make sure your friend circle are not like making each other miserable weird. by chasing yeah, status games. sneakers yeah. um like most of my friends are nerds who like can't tell anything about any brands they can't tell a two thousand dollar suit from a fifty dollar one uh and it's mostly signal by like how much they donate to charity right but also i have like friends who are grad students making twenty thousand, and some people who are you know like quantity hedge funds entrepreneurs making millions they're doing crypto trading and they kind of all dress the same. Right. No one really cares how much money you make. Uh, and so just like make friends that don't, you know, push each other into competitive conspicuous consumption. That's a good way to be miserable. Definitely. Definitely. It's a bad equilibrium, really bad equilibrium. Yeah. Nice. Um, my next question is, you know, why don't big countries have the best soccer teams? You know, they got the biggest pool of talent. Like, uh, why doesn't that average out in the end? Yeah. This is interesting. This is, kind of a reference uh my third blog post ever was about this it's directly back in 2015 um like as i mentioned because i just get interested in kind of different things every two weeks and bell curves isn't really one of them i had to go back and reread it be like, okay what the hell is happening there um like what happens here um this was actually my initial idea for the blog is the thing with like counterintuitive results of mathematical models um so we can say, like, what if we imagine that, like, soccer talent is distributed? It's like a normal distribution, like a bell curve. Um, like, each country might have a slightly different average. And then the population of that country is just, like, how many people are in the bell curve. Uh, you would say, look, this might not be a very, like, rigorous assumption. We don't actually know if it's true, if that's how it's distributed. Um, but then even if this model is not very accurate, it has some, like, very counterintuitive consequences. So one of them is, I think... People don't have a good intuition of how the uh, extreme tails of the normal distribution looks like. Uh, people get a sense that like, oh, there's a sharp drop and then it evens out around zero. Uh, but if you look at the relative height, the relative height actually like keeps dropping faster and faster the further out you go. So um, I think something like, I don't know, when you look at two standard deviations out, um, then maybe you have like kind of 5% or like two and a half percent on each side. And once you go to three standard deviations out, it's a bit less than the percent. So it drops by, like, by a factor of three or four. But then going from five to six drops by a factor of 250. So at five standard deviations, you have one in four million. And at six, you have roughly one in a billion. Uh, now what that means is, uh, like let's say you have a country of four million people. 
And so they have like one player who's at like five standard deviations out. And if you double your population, then now you have like two players who are that good. Uh, and if everybody in your country was just like slightly better, like even just, you know, half a standard deviation better, so you're going to move everyone to the right. Uh, okay, now you have 10,000 players at that skill level. Big difference. Um, and so, yeah, I think like some of the biggest countries like China or India, um, like the average Chinese or Indian person uh, is probably not as good at soccer. Again, like soccer correlates with height and Indians are just like shorter than Germans um, or people from Luxembourg. So like Luxembourg has a soccer team that's about as good as India with a fraction of the population just because Luxembourg people are taller. Um, it does show up in a lot of other places. Like, and I don't know, maybe soccer ability is one where it's kind of more comfortable to talk about differences between groups. Right. Uh, but you can start noticing in other places where small differences in average ability mean that the very extremes are just dominated by one group or another. Um, and also you start noticing those things that kind of show up everywhere. Definitely. Um, the hot hand effect. Is it real? Um, I think one of the fun story about the hot hand effect. So there's an initial research about hot hands effect in basketball. Basically, is a player who, you know, just like hit a few shots in a row likelier to hit the next one? Um, and the initial paper kind of disproving it, saying like, oh, this is just like an illusion. Uh, it's not real. It was co-authored by Amos Tversky. It's kind of one of the founding fathers of behavioral economics. And someone who basically everybody else who had anything to do with behavioral economics said like, I mean, there's like smart people around here, but even all the smart people think is the real genius. Uh, and that paper has like very basic mathematical mistakes that completely invalidated. <laughs> um, so, you know, they had some data, they looked at like the Boston Celtics, and then they just made some people at the Columbia University gym shoot some jump shots. And they actually put all the numbers in. The numbers clearly show a hot hand effect. <laughs> and their analysis showed that there is no hot hand effect because they just goofed. So instead of averaging per shot, they like looked at the, the average for each player. They said, okay, for each player, we're going to see what's their chance to hit after a make. And then, so we're going to take like one number for each person and average those out. What we should, you should really do is average per shot and not per player. So of course the hot head means that like a few players got into really hot streaks and hit like 10 shots in a row and demonstrated a clear hot hand. Uh, and so they kind of had a lot more shots in the sample and you devalued them because you just used, you know, like one number for uh, that person. Um, now there's been like more recent research that showed that yes, there seemed to be a slight hot hand effect. Uh, people like all kinds of explanations for it, um, right? I don't even know if like for basketball it's very important. Is it just that you know some players are better and some are worse? So you would kind of see who gets to take shots. Is it really about confidence? Is it you know it's just easier to repeat the motion you just did? So if you hit the free throw, you're likelier to hit the second one because like your brain doesn't need to change. You just do the same thing. Um, I actually don't know about that. I don't know if that's very interesting. The effect isn't very big. Uh, it's just interesting that this paper came out with like a very basic you know, mathematical mistake. Right. Uh, and nobody noticed for 30 years. <laughs> it's quite <laughs> horrifying. Just, yeah. A friend of mine, Joshua Miller, who's an economist, he just noticed it. Uh, <laughs> and even came up with like a toy example of if you're flipping coins, yeah. you know, if you measure, you know, the coin flips the way they measured it, by averaging per sequence of throws instead of per each throw, you get something like 45% of getting a tails <laughs> after a heads when it should be 50. Oh, uh, right? you're, you're always going to underestimate streaks if you miscount this way. Um, Impressive. Yeah, it, it, it's quite disturbing that it, uh, it went for so long, right? And it's common knowledge that, you know, high name effect, not real. And it was all because of a, a, a basic mathematical mistake in, in yeah. a paper. But... It's fine. Like, I don't know if it's common knowledge, right? Like I do remember... Uh, like playing uh, the NBA video game, like, I don't know, NBA 2011, probably yeah. the first one I got. Uh, and if your player hits like three shots in a row, there's literally like, a little flame around them. <laughs> right. And you try to pass it to them and they're like more likely to make the next one because people who play basketball video games, they like 100% know that the hot hand effect is real. And the announcers say, wow, Steph Curry is on fire. Right. Um, so, I mean, look, Academics got to feel smug for 30 years by saying, like, look, we're smarter, you know, we know that right. this is just an illusion. And basketball fans, you know, didn't read behavioral economics papers. 
So they got to feel happy that Steph Curry is on fire. And I think maybe people didn't like notice this because no one really cares. Right. It's not not that important. That's cool. That's cool. Um, are you down for a round of overrated or underrated? Sure. So I'll, I'll throw a turn out. Tell us uh, whether it's overrated or underrated and uh, maybe a sentence or two why. Um, so Keenan Flagler, overrated or underrated? Um, like I said, I think business schools in general are underrated by almost everyone who's going to listen to this podcast. Um, so I kind of can't tell people I'm an MBA. Because people are like, ah, you're like one of those like dumb jokes who just like empty suits <laughs> and stuff, right? Because all my friends are nerds. They're probably all of yours and everyone who will listen to an intellectual yeah. podcast. Uh, I think business schools are a great life hack. You're kind of like on vacation for two years and then you get a six-figure job. And it doesn't really constrain you. If you went to law school, you kind of want to be a lawyer. And if you went yeah. to business school, you can be whatever. Um, and if you are going to business school, then Kinnon Flag is just like a great place to spend two years. I think which school you go to doesn't really matter in terms of the jobs you're going to get. Uh, and so you may as well, you know, stay in a warm college town <laughs> where everyone is friendly and the beer is cheap. Right. And so Kinnon Flag really is like hard to beat. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. No, highly recommend Chapel Hill. That's great. Um, Julian Jaynes, overrated or underrated? Um, it's a bit hard to tell exactly how rated it is. Um, I think the two kind of ratings of Julian Jaynes is either, is that that crank guy who thought that like ancient Greeks were unconscious? Or it's, okay, his book is kind of batshit, but it's worth reading even if you don't believe it. Um, I would say he's underrated. I think the main thing I got from his book is he's trying to make a case that language is a prerequisite for consciousness. You can't really be conscious without work, without words. And then I think kind of a lot of evidence came out right after he wrote it, which seemed to go against it. And people were like, well, that turned out to be wrong. And now I actually think most people underrate how important language is for consciousness. Um, and there's an excellent book I read recently called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who made a pretty compelling case that you can't really feel emotions until you learn the concept for them. That something like anger isn't something innate or something that's like the same for every individual. It's like a collective name for, you know, this a very complex mental thing that looks different in different people. And you can only really feel it when somebody points out to you when you're a kid, look, that person's angry. And so I feel like kind of some of Julian Jason's ideas are making a comeback, even though, you know, maybe no one's going as far as to say like Bronze Age Greeks just hallucinated gods. Right. I love that. No, I think that's a great, great analysis. Um, Madden, overrated or underrated? Um, so I assume you're talking about the video game. Yeah, not, that's right. Uh, the coach. Um, I think it's kind of funny. I think like, Madden is a video game that's extremely underrated by both the people who play it and people who are just like video game critics. Um, so Madden is simulated football. Uh, simulated football is pretty much the most fun multiplayer video game you can have because it has so much depth. You have everything from the strategy of building your team to making like split, you know, second decision around like how to execute. Uh, and like if you get into it, it's just like a very exciting and fun thing that also makes watching the nfl a lot more interesting because you like learn you know different coverages and schemes and all the tactics and the moves and counter moves um people underrated because they release a new game every year and charge 70 dollars for it and the game is exactly the same as last year except it right. updated rosters and so if you think of it as like oh i just paid for a new video game it's not a new video game it seems like a bad deal if you think of it oh i got another year subscription to play an online simulated football that's pretty fun um and also, I think people who are really into video games are not the people who are really into watching football. Uh, right. Because the stereotype that people who play Madden are, you know, like just guys who smoke a lot of weed or African American teenagers. That's probably true, but like that doesn't mean it's not a great video game. Right. Yeah, it's got a lot, a lot of depth. You know, there's this chess aspect to it where, you know, there's yeah, anyway, I'm the only person like, I know yeah. who plays Madden multiplayer. Nice. So, right, I'm like, I'm an immigrant, you know, urban, like, educated person who's kind of into, like, narrative-driven games. So, yeah, I like, not a single person I think that I know in person has ever played it. We were kind of confused when they tell them about it. I love that. Um, I love that. Uh, next one is voting. Overrated or underrated? Yeah. So, I wrote about kind of the impact of voting and, like, what actually happens in the country. Uh, 
in which case I think it has to be overrated because like the actual impact of your vote is literally zero, pretty much always, no matter where you live. And, you know, it's like in a swing state, you know, just the fact that like, you can't really know who's going to be a better president that they all promise stuff. No one actually follows up on them. Uh, but you can think that, you know, there's like a hundred million people in the U S who are eligible to be president and some mysterious, like, you know, forces beyond your can <laughs> narrow it down from a hundred million to like five. <laughs> right. and then you get to the primary, you get to vote between <laughs> those five. And like, that's not where it happened. Now, I don't think that's actually where people vote. I think people vote is because in some sense, civil democracy is uh, the state religion of the United States. Uh, and it's not a very demanding one, but you know, it demands some rituals. Right. Uh, like, you know, you can't say that you don't read the news or care what's happening. Right. Because then you're like not fulfilling your obligation to the gods. Right. Uh, and of course you have to vote. That's like the main thing, the main ritual you have to participate in. Um, yeah, I'm like not sure like how exactly beneficial the state religion is. Um, like there's a clear like one benefit of it is that you know people keep believing in this sort of like made up narrative that's called the United States, right? Uh, which seems to be important and good. Um, so, right, like if I could press a button, and actually make like you know most people not vote, and instead like save this half hour of their life every four years, I wouldn't. I would think that's too much of a risk. And I generally like the U.S. as is. Uh, but, you know, if someone has like, something really important happening on election day, kind of want to whisper to them, like, it's okay. You know, <laughs> Zeus is not going to get angry. The country is not going to go to hell because you, like, didn't go cast your vote for this person or that person. Like, you can relax. Definitely. Um, empathy. Overrated or underrated? Yeah. So the person kind of who made the case against empathy was, I think, Paul Bloom. And this is the thing I wrote about. Um kind of made the difference between uh, empathy is like being able to feel what the other person is feeling and sympathy, which kind of just like having compassion for them. And he mentioned that just, you know, like being very like, you know, very susceptible to just catching other people's emotions might not be good and might not be the most helpful thing to them. Um, yeah. So that's kind of making the case against the sort of like, you know, a, more about making the difference in empathy or not. Um, also, if you come from, I guess, the side of effective altruism, that tells you that empathy is just like a very, very poor guide to useful philanthropy because empathy is really designed to work in very near mode, like on people you know, right. or the puppy that you see in the street. Uh, whereas actually, if you live in a rich country, the most impact you can do is on people who are far away from you, either like in geography or in time, or just like in how much you know about them. Um, I'm not sure. There seems to be kind of a backlash. Like, for example, um, the general meme going around is that if somebody calls themselves an empath, it means they're a terrible person <laughs> who just, like, you know, makes up stories about other people and then tries to <laughs> shoehorn them into it. So empathy in general seems to be quite lowly rated. So I'm not even sure if it's overrated anymore. Maybe I thought it's overrated for, like, some reasons, but then everybody else gave up on it as even a thing to talk about or cultivate for completely different reasons. And now maybe we actually need some more of it. <laughs> maybe slightly <laughs> underrated at this point then. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, Jacob, um, thank you so much for coming on today. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Where can people find you? Where should we send them? Um, people can find me. I think probably the best way to stay in touch with everything in me is on Twitter at Yashkaf. Um, they can read me at putanamone.com. Um, I'm gonna have like written anything for a few weeks, but I'm gonna have a big essay coming out and also a link to an essay I wrote about brains and AI from Metaculus. Um, also, uh, I think probably the next thing I'm going to write is my resume and cover letter. Oh, really? Because, yeah, people think asking like why I write all this stuff for free, and like, well, I'm not really gonna go on the Substack. Um, but the way kind of my writing can pay off for me is people you know could know who i am and what i'm good at then they might want to work with me uh and so now i'm on parental leave with my baby and can i get a chance to like look at my career and my job is kind of boring so <laughs> maybe one of your listeners or one of my readers you want to like you know read a bit more about my career and decide that i'm exactly the person they need 
uh, in their startup or their project. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll get that out there. Well, um, Jacob, thanks so much again for coming on. Um, really appreciate it. And we'll put those links in the show notes. Sure. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives. 